No book, article, or I should say words, can capture the intensity of relationships in collectivist societies. So brilliantly smothering, in your face, sometimes in the form of kisses on the cheek, and invigorating are these relationships that the self is lost to the collective, and the harmony of the group becomes more important than silly old you. As isms, individualism and collectivism are often politicized, viewed as either good or bad. Despite their flaws to capture and explain cultural phenomena and the biases they evoke, these isms do hint at relational and learning styles that teachers should understand. Zaretta Hammond says, quote, I don't want to stereotype cultures in an oversimplified frame, but to simply offer the archetype of collectivism versus individualism as a way of understanding the general cultural orientation among diverse students in the classroom, end quote. Sociologist Geert Hofstadt says, quote, In a collectivist society, the relationship comes first, the task comes second. In the individualistic society, the task comes first, and the relationship may come afterwards. This relationship-first approach is essential for American teachers to understand. When I lived in the country Georgia, when a guest entered your home, even if the guest came unannounced, you stopped what you were doing and served them. The person took priority over the task. This is such a relational paradigm shift for many Americans that it seems wrong, leading to teachers misinterpreting students' cultural behavior as misbehavior, and leading to students misinterpreting American teachers as cold, impersonal, and putting work ahead of people. As a culturally relevant teacher, the onus is on you not the child, to bridge these cultural gaps. According to Hofstede's Cultural Dimensions Index, the United States is the most individualistic society in the world. This means many American teachers are going to have blind spots when it comes to their relational style with students. In the United States, we are often told to pursue aspirations and dreams for ourselves. It is a personal journey. It is believed that you must find yourself and create yourself, and if others stand in the way, you must continue to believe in yourself. The goal is to become self-sufficient and independent, and if that means leaving the collective, so be it. Social harmony, though a good thing, can also be a detriment to, to societal progress and self-growth. Hofstede says the key word in collectivist groups is harmony. There should be harmony inside the in-group. Even if people disagree, they should maintain the superficial harmony. Otherwise, the in-group will be weakened. This is why some of my students in South Korea, though knowing the correct answer in class, would refuse to raise their hands. They did not want to show off, but wanted to remain humble for the harmony of the group. This is also why Korean immigrants in the past needed to be coached on how to interview for jobs in the United States. The emphasis on advocating for yourself and bragging about your accomplishments was viewed as wrong. When interviewees were asked about their English abilities, they would downplay them, despite speaking excellent English. Maintaining humility and not standing out was important for group cohesion. As teachers, it is our job to not only build relationships with students, but to see rela relationships in a new light. In collectivist cultures, interdependence is often seen positively. This is why, once you have built rapport and trust with students, you can use what Lisa Delpit calls a, quote, communicative style that appeals to affiliation, end quote. Asking students from collectivist backgrounds to do the work for you, the teacher, is a technique that works because it caters to a student's desire to belong. In fact, Delpit encourages teachers to be authoritative in their use of affiliation because this mirrors the home culture of many students of color. In America, you are taught to do the work for yourself, to find your why. Motivation is a personal affair. In collectivist cultures, motivation comes in a more group-oriented and communal form. American teachers also need 
to build genuine relationships with students. Many Americans are blind to the fact that a business or work relationship doesn't work in many collectivist contexts. A relationship is a relationship, and having merely a work relationship seems disingenuous and fake. This is why many cultures refer to Americans, at least relationally, as cold. This means teachers must not use relationships as a technique to leverage students, for this will cause students to distrust, to distrust you more. Instead, teachers need to focus on the art of small talk, forging genuine curiosity of our students' lives, and at times, prioritizing relationships over work. This realness, authenticity, and bonding often needs to take place before learning occurs. I will say it one more time. Unless you have felt it and experienced it, the intensity of relationships in collectivist societies is unlike anything we have in the United States. To be culturally relevant and to act as a cultural bridge builder, teachers must think about their relational style in the classroom differently. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Tolentino Teaching.